Hi everyone. Um, welcome to this online talk with VA Dundee. My name is Jules, I'm the learning manager here. Before I welcome our speaker, Kirsty Hazard, I wanted to draw your attention to some accessibility feature for this afternoon's talk. The event is being live closed captioned and interpreted into BSL. Detailed instructions on how to use these features have been posted in the chat, so please have a look there. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation, um, but only use the Q&A function so that we can keep track and try and get everybody's questions answered at the end. Um, I'm now going to invite Kirsty to join us so she can start her talk. Thanks. It's, uh, thank you for joining me today. Um, and thank you to Jules, Nicole, and all the learning team at v and Dundee for their support um, and inviting me to speak today. Um, so I'm Kirsty Hazard, and I am one of the curators at v and Dundee. I've been working on the Quant exhibition over the past few months, um, along with my colleagues in the Exhibitions Department, uh, Meredith Moore and Barry Maxwell. I started my career in museums uh, working at V&A South Kensington uh, in the fa uh, furniture, textiles and fashion department, where uh, about 40% of the objects, over 40% of the objects uh, in the exhibition come from. So it's been great to be reunited with so many familiar objects here at V&A Dundee. Um, we enjoyed a wonderful talk from uh, Steph Woods, uh, the curator of Quant at uh, V&A South Kensington uh, earlier in the month on Quant and cosmetics. And I'm here today to talk about another part of that story, um, Quant's Boutique Bazaar, uh, where her clothing was stocked um, in London um, in the 50s and 60s, and the impact and reach um, of boutique shopping across the UK in the late 50s and throughout the 60s. The scope of the exhibition covers 1955 to 1975, uh, which is what I'll be covering today. Um, I'll speak for about 40 to 45 minutes and then I will leave some time for questions at the end. So as Steph covered um, a few weeks ago and to recap, uh, the exhibition Mary Quant is the first major fashion exhibition at v and Dundee and it's the first international retrospective on the iconic British designer who disrupted the fashion establishment, captured the spirit of London in the 60s and started a fashion revolution for a whole generation who wanted to take part in, and it still continues today. Uh, the exhibition design um, of the show uh, in uh, London um, and at v and Dundee reflects the development of Quant's career, particularly in regard to the setting up and development of the boutiques. And I'll show you how this is achieved uh, as we talk through the presentation today. And in many ways, the story of Quant and her success is how her clothes were sold. Um, so in the early days, going from boutique to wholesale, uh, mass production, and then um, the sort of international uh, global uh, reach of the brand. And this is what shapes the structure of the exhibition. So the, the story of Bazaar is synonymous with Quant's career and that of her business partner, um, Archie McNair and Alexander Plunkett Green, who of course later uh, was her husband. Um, and this is a picture from uh, later on in her career uh, when she collects her OBE. Um, and yeah, the three of them decided to work together and uh, open a shop um, on, on the King's Road. Uh, McNair and Plunkett Green both invested uh, £5,000 each to buy the basement and ground floor of Markham House um, on the corner of, of Markham Square. So uh, Archie McNair had been in London um, already uh, since about 1950 and he had already bought some property on the King's Road. Um, he bought a shop with a flat above on 128 uh, King's Road. And he had converted this into a photography studio and named it the Alistair Jordan. Um, and this studio was used by a team um, of young photographers, including Anthony Armstrong Jones, uh, who would later become Lord Snowden and would be married to uh, Princess Margaret. Um, the location of the studio was, was really important um, because it became the focus of the Chelsea set when McNair opened a coffee bar in 1954. Uh, which is what you can see in the image here. And it was one of the first coffee bars in London and the first outside Soho, and it was called the, the Fantasy. 
and it had an Italian Pavoni espresso machine, um, again, one of the first in London, and it functioned as a sort of common room uh, for artists, actors and aristocrats who lived in the houses and bedsets of the surrounding streets and squares. It was a huge success and it was crowded every night with a large group of people who would uh, be known to become to be known as, as the Chelsea set. In evenings, uh, vodka was occasionally and illegally uh, added to the drinks and a local Chelsea band called the Chaz Devitt Skiffle Group uh, regularly played here. Um, and it's a continuation um, to the group that McNair had been working with in the, the, photo, uh, the photography studio. Um, so the friends and neighbours that surrounded the shop were, were really quite important. So they included people like, as I mentioned, um, Anthony Armstrong Jones, uh, the Honourable Robert Erskine, who was the Marcus of Bristol, and the publisher Mark Boxer, who worked on the revitalised Queen magazine. And it was the, the combination um, of, of McNair uh, coming in partnership uh, with Quant and Plunkett Green that was so important um, because he provided business and legal expertise, whereas Plunkett Green provided charm. Um, he was incredible at public relations and he was much sought after uh, by the ladies of the fashion world that would obviously become important uh, throughout Quant's career. And he had wit, humour and the social progress that enabled the team to generate headlines and fashion stories and market these to the fashion press of London uh, and to their readers. What was important was that both men understood the potential for Quant's talent for design and they helped develop this into a huge market. Um, so the boutique started as a small and, and dynamic uh, boutique selling accessories and pajamas to friends in southwest London and obviously by the end became an international fashion brand. Bazaar was one of the few shops in London that offered an alternative to the mature styles that were being produced by other high street fashion designers uh, and stores and a radically different shopping experience uh, than the couturiers, department stores and chain stores that made up the mainstream uh, fashion market, which I'll talk about later. So from the beginning, um, Archie McNair and uh, Alexander Quant, uh, Archie McNair and Alexander Plunkett Green had clear ideas about how they wanted the shop to look. Uh, so for one, they wanted to uh, replace the existing front windows with a plain glazed shop front and uh, to take away the railings to leave a large forecourt. And these were actually really quite controversial changes that, that they wanted to make. Um, it provoked strong objections from the London County Council Planning Department and it took six months. Um, but this was really quite important in, in Quant's career because this time allowed her to buy stock from the shop and get to know fashion wholesalers and to visit art schools uh, to buy jewellery and made by students. And the name, uh, much like everything else in uh, Quant's career, was uh, really quite important. Um, and a really quite clever choice, um, as you can see from, from the images that I've, I've referenced here. Um, the name implied that the shop sold odd and interesting, bizarre uh, things, and it also recalled the eclectic mix of artifacts to be found at a market um, or a church fair. Bazaars are important in the history of retailing. Uh, going back to the 18th century, um, the first bazaars were covered walkways where exhibitions as well as shopping stalls encou encouraged shopping as uh, a leisure activity, um, which is obviously something that the idea of shopping becoming um, more of a leisure activity rather than something practical is something that had been going on uh, since the 19th century and, and Quan inherited this uh, with bazaar. And the, the location of the shop was integral um, to success. And Quant later observed in 1966 in her autobiography, Chelsea ceased to be a small part of London. It became international. Its name interpreted as a way of living and a way of dressing far more than a ge geographical base. Uh, and there was definitely a, a history um, of creative types uh, being in Chelsea before Bazaar. Um, it had long been home to artists and it provided a London base um, for the upper classes. By the 1950s, uh, when Quant opens Bazaar, it, the area attracted both young professionals and students, um, but it was also a popular area for middle-class families. Uh, amongst the family homes were houses divided into uh, bed sets um, or studios that attracted artists and actors. 
Um, and as I mentioned already, Quan and uh, her husband were at the center um, of this group of people throughout their career. So following the, the media fame um, of Quan and Bazaar um, and the other boutiques which soon opened and, and followed it, the King's Road became a catwalk uh, with young women wearing big floppy hats, uh, skinny red sweaters, keyhole dresses, white hipster belts, white lipstick lips and thick black eyeliner, hair cut at alarming angles, all part earrings and ankle length white boots. Um, what was being marketed at this early stage was also really important too. So things like black stretch tights and small plastic white collars that were sold at two and six, and they were sold in literally the thousands. In 1959, in an interview, she recalled that we opened with imports from Italy and Austria that were really newsy and kept selling out in the first few weeks. The next step was getting London wholesale houses to make up my own designs. And eventually I was able to open my own workroom. It appears to have taken um, about a year or so uh, for Quant to get to this stage. Um, so from the beginning, uh, nightwear was included in an eclectic mix of garments, including a bright red nightgown featured in the Christmas edition of the Picture Post in 1955. Um, and Quant describes that the shop uh, opening um, after the restaurant. So uh, Archie McNair um, opened uh, a restaurant in, in the basement um, below Bazaar. Um, and there was a, a party that spilled out um, into a marquee outside. And that's really from the sort of very early uh, stages um, of the shop opening. So it sets the tone for this kind of fun and, and vibrant um, atmosphere. I notice in September 1955, uh, Harper's Bazaar suggests that the opening was later than planned, um, as it ended up um, opening uh, later in, in 1955, about a month or, or two months later. It was a huge success and within 10 days uh, they had completely sold out merchandise. Um, Quant said people were sort of three deep outside the window. The Royal Court Theatre people were mad about what we were doing and it was very much the men who were bringing their girlfriends around and saying this is terrific, uh, you must have some of this. It was very much a mixing of people as well um, which is really synonymous with uh, Quant and Plunkett Green's uh, social circle. So it was old friends mixing with junior assistants from fashion magazines um, and from that point the, the party atmosphere was revived every night and um, Alexander's Club like restaurant which was in the basement uh, fueled sales in the shop uh, upstairs. So the blurring of work um, with social life uh, meant that Bazaar initially opened late, uh, even on Saturdays, in an era when many shops closed at midday um, on a Saturday. Um, after a visit from a shop act inspector, Bazaar had to close on uh, Saturday evenings, but this was actually really quite important because this became the time that Quant and Plunkett Green would change the shop window displays. Um, and in the exhibition, um, this is how we've uh, tried to recreate this. So the, initially they were just a place where they could pin uh, blouses or hats um, flat to boards, uh, which is what you can see here. And the pink blouse um, that you see on the back, uh, this one here, um, that was one of the earliest pieces that, that Quan uh, made herself. Um, but over time, um, these windows became an art form and they were just a brilliant form of marketing um, intending uh, to, to shock and amaze people. And uh, she's quoted as saying, uh, we wanted to entertain people um, as well to sell to them. And I think this photo is yeah, pretty um, symbolic of that. Um, occasionally they would make some colossal extravagant gesture uh, meant as a, a pure joke, uh, wanting the old ladies who had no intention of buying anything to stop and stare. Uh, so we had to be arrogant then. arrogant then. We had to make a sharp, shocking statement at the beginning uh, to be noticed at all. The, the windows and the whole ethos um, of Bazaar uh, shared a spirit of irrelevance, uh, irreverence sorry, and satire uh, with the new theatre, uh, television and publishing. Um, so you really have to think about the whole social context and, and cultural context at that time. So this is uh, the time when Beyond the Fringe, Private Eye and That Was the Week That Was uh, were all launched. And the displays were ever-changing and very eclectic. Um, for example, sometimes the displays would purposefully appeal to husbands and boyfriends, um, the women buying the clothes. Um, so for example, the Christmas window in 1960 was photographed by an art student who worked in the building 
worked in the building um, opposite. Um, and it was a mannequin uh, dressed in a simple shift with a white bodice and a black skirt that was posed opposite a Harley Davidson motorbike um, emerging out of a huge foil wrap parcel. A handwritten speech bubble caption read, thinks just what I always wanted. Uh, Christmas windows, um, which required special effort for all retailers, could involve uh, logistical challenges uh, for friends of the, the Plunkett Greens, um, as uh, Shirley Conran, who's the partner of uh, Terence Conran, who later worked on one of the shops, commented. And she said, um, once Alexander woke me about midnight, uh, just before Christmas, to frantically ask, have you got a stuffed partridge? No, only a stuffed squirrel or stuffed fish. Um, in glass cases, no good, how about a pear tree? In the exhibition, we tried to recreate uh, some of the, the ethos and, and the spirit um, of how Quant's window displays at Bazaar. Um, so for example, um, there was windows that um, employed surrealist tactics, uh, such as one with a figure leading um, a large, uh, dead but clean, uh, which was emphasised, uh, lobster on a lead um, that we've recreated uh, in, in the exhibition is seen here. Um, another one, for example, showed a, a photographer figure hung upside down, um, his camera pointing at a mannequin hung at an obscure angle. And Bizarre brought a distinctive dry uh, British sense of humour to the art of shop window displays. American department stores, uh, such as Marshall Fields in Chicago, uh, were firmly established as leaders in visual merchandising um, and they had reflected art movements such as surrealism and um, which is obviously what, what Quant is trying to reference here with the reference to Dali and, and Scaparelli but they've been doing that since at least the 1930s um, and by the 1950s uh, artists such as Roy Lichtenstein, uh, Klaus Oldenburg and um, Andy Warhol were working on the window displays of shops such as uh, Bonwick Teller and um, the New York department store. And uh, at the, in America, um, they were definitely much further ahead um, than Britain. Um, and really, Quant is one of the first designers that really starts off a sort of like, yeah, innovative, eclectic um, way of, of decorating windows. Um, in the UK, it took until uh, the Ryman School of Art and Design um, set up their, their commercial art uh, course, uh, commercial displays course, sorry, and they were the first really to focus on that. And they were one of the teachers there, um, Natasha Kroll, um, who taught at the school and coincidentally gave Ter uh, Terence Conran his first display commission, uh, became the display manager um, for the clothing store Simpson of Piccadilly. And Quant and Plunkett Green would certainly have seen some of these and it would have inspired them in how they thought about their own uh, window designs. And uh, David Millerick, the interior designer said, I remember the typeface and the big plate glass windows and the fact there were just two dresses um, and you saw straight into the shop. There might have been a screen or something, but it wasn't a normal shop window display. It wasn't 18 dresses with lipstick and pretend wigs on. It was a different look altogether. It was terrific. And one of the other things um, that we've recreated in the show is the innovative mannequins that Quant chose to use. And she worked with a display artist, uh, John Bates, um, different to the fashion designer, John Bates, and a company called uh, Barway Designs to create figures with contemporary high-boned angular faces and the most up-to-date haircuts. She said, I wanted them with long lean legs like Jane Shrimpton, uh, made to stand at real life, uh, stand like real life photographic models in gawky poses with legs wide apart one knee bent almost at right angles and one toe pointing upwards from a heel stuck arrogantly into the ground. By using images um, of the original mannequins, the poses of the models Quant used and fashion photographs, the textile conservators and costume mounters at V&A South Kensington in collaboration with the original uh, curatorial team were able to collaborate with the London-based mannequin company Proportion to achieve these looks and recreate the dynamic poses um, of the mannequins and models um, in the exhibition, uh, which some of them you can see here. Um, so retrospectively, and uh, recalled in her, her autobiography, uh, written uh, 10 years after the first shop opened, Quant recalled the early days of Bazaar as an awful hand-to-mouth existence. Um, the accounting was haphazard and the trio were not taken seriously by the fashion trade. Quant sold dresses at night to sell next day in the shop. 
She said, I had to sell one day's output before I had the money to go out and buy more material. And their collective lack of experience in the fashion business meant that they sold their clothes and accessories uh, too cheaply, which meant losing uh, money on everything they sold, but also upsetting the local shops and their wholesalers um, by undercutting the fixed retail prices. However, young people soon took notice and the brand began, sorry, began to become more established. Although in the early days, the clothes weren't particularly cheap um, or affordable. And as I mentioned already, um, initially rather than designing clothes for the shop, Quant gave herself the task of buying um, and, and stopped, the, stopped the shop with uh, these initially. So owing to Plunkett Green's connections with fashion journalists, the fashion magazine Harper's Bazaar became an early supporter of the brand. In the September 1955 edition, a small photograph of smart tan pyjamas with big penny spots for four guineas was featured in the shopping bazaar feature. And the caption at this point mentions Quant um, as a young milliner. Um, this is where she'd started her career was uh, trimming hats um, in a milliner's. Um, later, but these pyjamas turned out to be really quite iconic because they were one of the first pieces of clothing that she designed um, and they cost five pounds, which was a whole week's wages, wages for her. And it's around about this point that the focus um, changes uh, for Quant. So rather than uh, just buying stock for the shop, um, she was inspired to focus on designing clothes, um, which marks this change in her career. Um, in the early stages, she began adapting buttricks patterns and making clothes in her bed set. Um, using fabric she bought at Harrods with only basic dressmaking skills. And later she brought on three dressmakers and a cutter to help. These dresses were a huge success um, and sold um, as soon as they were made. And she did continue to stock other wholesale ranges though, which reflected her style and what she thought customers wanted to buy. Uh, the exhibition also reflects the customers uh, who bought and wore Quant's clothing. Um, at different stages in her career, and I'll go on to talk about that a bit more later. Um, but in the early stages of Bazaar, her customers were initially a small group of friends and local residents of Chelsea. Um, but as the area became more developed, her clientele became much more diverse. And Quant uh, sums this up by saying snobbery had gone um, out of fashion. And in her shops, you'll find duchesses jostling with typists uh, to, to buy the same dress. And part of her success was her ability to identify gaps in the market and to recognise what, what young people wanted in an era of social change. She saw women like herself who were rejecting stereotypes such as debutantes who required formal dresses for dances and silk afternoon dresses for Ascot and Henley. Um, and there's definitely this coming change in the social order. And yeah, there's a display um, in the exhibition entitled The Death of the Debutant, um, because the formal coming out and court presentations ended in 1958, which was the same year um, as Quant's latest branch of Bazaar, the, the one that came after the King's Road branch, um, opened. But in the early years um, of Bazaar and of Quant's career, there's still very much an overlap with this era, um, especially women who needed gowns and party dresses for these uh, formal occasions. And one of these would cost about 15 and a half guineas, um, which is around about 341 pounds today. Um, whereas a couture party gown would be double the price. And Quant also recognized, um, and you can see this really from, from the quote on the back, that there was two extremes uh, developing in Chelsea at this time. So there was uh, wildly pseudo bohemians um, who were renovating old houses and wearing ex exaggerated fashions. Um, with poor students who were wearing the, the beatnik um, style of clothing. And in response to this, uh, Quant was very much inspired by what was going on around her. It's really one of the reasons why she was so successful. Um, so she drew inspiration from the mods. Um, so she created simple, stylish clothes, which were cool, sharp, almost anonymous and classless and inclusive. And she was featured in an article in Harper's Bazaar in uh, 1957 that perfectly encapsulates this look. Uh, so um, by 1957, so only two years uh, after uh, the original shop is opened, the time had come to expand the retail business further from the original King's Road boutique, um, this time in Knightsbridge, uh, right opposite from Harrods. And unlike the King's Road boutique that was designed in-house, uh, Terence Conran was commissioned to design the interior. He designed the staircase and the mezzanine level. 
And Conran commented that Quant and her partners wanted the boutique to be constantly on the move uh, with customers and models changing clothes and coming up and down the stairs. Uh, they didn't want anything to confuse this idea of a fashion show. And this is really the point that Quant um, and Bazaar become a major fashion brand and force in London. Uh, the shop opened in the autumn uh, with a press party and a fashion show, making the most of uh, the, the mezzanine uh, gallery stairs uh, that you can see uh, up here uh, and, and here where she's standing on the stairs. Um, and that was organised with the help of a fashion editor, uh, fashion editor, sorry, uh, Claire Reddishlam, who inspired the shop's first mention in Vogue in uh, December 1958. So the new shop continued the bizarre format of surprising shop displays and uh, lively fashion shows to a more mainstream audience. Um, as I previously mentioned, the, the shop was well designed to stage fashion shows, um, having a mezzanine and the, the feature staircase, and she would continue to use a small selection um, of her favourite models to showcase the design, her new designs, um, which would uh, continue until the shop closed in, in 1970. And something that becomes um, really more common um, as the brand continued, uh, Quant and, and Plunkett Green became the faces of the brand, um, accompanied with a bold graphic design that featured on the bizarre van, um, carrier bags, receipts and letterheads. It's very rare for garments to survive from uh, the early years um, of Bazaar. Uh, one of the earliest that's featured in the exhibition is a pinafore made from striped wool, and another is this purple silk dress uh, that you see here um, that the owner described as uh, buying it as a coming of age uh, landmark. Um, and it's also at this stage that Quant begins to um, to have collaborations with uh, textile manufacturers, which is something that she continues through her career. Um, but at this point, it was with Edward Rain, uh, the shoemaker, and with uh, John Lang of Hoyk, um, a knitwear manufacturer from the Scottish borders. So by the early uh, 1960s, there were um, increasing demands for Quant's designs. Uh, the first Mary Quant wholesale range was launched in autumn 1961 and there were 11 stockists, uh, such as the London Department Store Liberties. It was very successful and the number of stockists were expanded to be outside of London. Um, the North East, including Newcastle, Liverpool, Chester, Leeds and Hull, and uh, smaller towns like Southwold that was uh, hugely successful in, in selling quant. The team uh, were very particular in who they sold to. They only wanted to sell to those who could show the clothes as a group and to their best advantage. Um, and advertisements at this time um, include a double page, double page spread in the Times in May 1961 um, that show the new stockists as Marshall and Snellgrove in uh, Leeds, you can see on the left, um, Darlings in Edinburgh uh, on Princess Street and Wallens in London. One of the key ethos um, of Quant, um, as is covered in the exhibition, is the accessibility and the democratisation of fashion, um, making fashion, fashion more accessible to a wider audience. And this became increasingly more apparent um, during the, the 1960s, um, as the wholesale range made her work available to more people at lower prices. The company at this point was able to expand um, but without expanding the shop, so still keeping the core base um, in, in Knightsbridge um, and on the King's Road. And this development also paved the way for the collaboration uh, with the American department store, um, JC Penney, who successfully sold their clothing through catalogues. And this was launched in 1962. And the quant look uh, very much appealed um, to the American youth market. And the initial line consisted of colour coordinated a mix and match sportswear um, that was made in American junior sizes. And the line continued throughout the 60s, and it was the first time that the clothes of a named British designer had been promoted through a large chain of stores um, across America. And this also uh, led to the establishment of uh, Ginger Group um, in 1963. Um, and as with everything else, names are obviously very, very important um, to Quant. And the name is a nod uh, to the 
British political term, um, ginger group, that refers to an activist group in a political party that advocates stronger action um, on a particular issue. Um, it was advertised as quant close at budget prices. Uh, to buy a piece at a time, everything goes with everything else in Mary Quant's ginger group, um, designed to be modular and affordable. An advert in Vogue lists 59 stockists across the UK, uh, 16 in London, and a mix of department stores and boutiques. And uh, later, 110 stores across the UK had special Mary Quant sections. Feature in uh, late 1963 showed the further spread of the business. Um, it sold over 200,000 garments a year to shops in Britain, America, Kenya, South Africa, France, Switzerland, Australia, um, and New Zealand. So yeah, just did a uh, talk really about the, the We Want Quant uh, campaign that for those of you who have been to the exhibition um, or read um, a little bit about the exhibition um, might know of. Um, so this was a call out that was done in uh, the, the early stages of putting the show together at VA South Kensington. Um, there was a call out for women to share their, their stories, um, their dresses, um, and yeah, their general experience um, of of wearing and, and owning quant and had a huge response um, over a thousand things and uh, a lot of the lot of the dresses ended up um, in the exhibition but the story that this told stole the story this told uh, sort of showed that quant uh, wasn't just uh, a London story um, although obviously it was the two stores that were in London um, she was obviously bought her clothes were bought and, and worn um, all across uh, the UK and there's uh, one in particular um, from this that I want to talk about um, which is uh, and I know Jenny's listening but um, yeah uh, Jenny Fenwick who um, wore and uh, donated the the mustard dress and um, that you mustard crochet dress that you see at V&A Dundee as you walk into the show as part of the evolution um, of the mini skirt uh, part of the exhibition um, and when I asked her about her experience of uh, buying this dress it is really sort of synonymous with the idea that, yeah, the, the story of Quant was a, yeah, spread out to be a UK story. I'm quoting Jenny when I say this, but she said, uh, I bought the dress from Peter Robinson's Topshop um, within Peter Robinson's store. Uh, the Topshop chain actually began in 1964 um, as a section in the Sheffield branch of Peter Robinson. Um, and it just shows that it wasn't just London where things were happening. It cost about eight guineas. Uh, from what I remember, there was a Mary Quant section there, along with other designers such as Cossie Clark, uh, Jeff Banks, uh, Radley, etc. I was in sixth form at the time, and my parents gave me a clo clothing allowance, uh, which I saved up with uh, to buy the dress. And then at uh, VA Dundee, um, we had our own call, uh, call out as well called um, So Quant. And in the exhibition, um, this is uh, added to the, the photographs and, and yeah, memories um, of, of the London uh, part of, of the exhibition. Um, and here we chose to mention the memories um, of five women um, who came from round about the, the Dundee area. Um, and one of them, um, Norma Martin, who is this lady uh, in the, the bottom uh, right corner. Um, so when I asked her about her experience of buying her dress, um, hers is also really interesting too because her experience is more about the retail side of it. Um, so her mother was a partner in a business in John Street in Montrose, um, not that far from Dundee. And the shop was called Helen Carnegie Limited. Um, and it was one of those shops found in a small town with a big name. Customers came from all over Scotland and it had a wonderful reputation. On the ground floor, lingerie, hosiery, etc. Upstairs, dresses, coats, suits and evening gowns. Um, also on this floor, a sewing room with three full time seamstresses. Then on the top floor, wedding dresses and other wedding wear. My mother did all the buying. When I, met, when I became old enough, and um, as you know, quite tall, she mentioned this in her quote, um, I started accompanying her on her buying trips. On the ground floor of the shop, an outlet became available next door. So we extended through and decided it would become a boutique. As ever, my mother never missed an opportunity and Mary Quant came to Montrose, 
what coup for us to get it. We knew we had something special. I wore a lot of it, the short dresses and skirts, the patterned tights with loafers and shiny knee high boots with buckles. We did a lot of fashion shows with big audiences. I loved it, what a time it was. And to extend the, the story a little bit more, um, the exhibition is now con obviously now located in Dundee and uh, obviously makes sense to refer to some D, uh, Dundee stockists um, of Quant. Um, I've only found two and I would love if anyone in the comments um, or QA and was able to point me to some more. Um, there was definitely at least two. So there was Lillian's Boutique um, that was located uh, on Whitehall Crescent, which is about a five minute walk from the museum. And as you can see from the advertisements, um, it specifically states that it was a stockist of Quant. Um, and some of the women from the So Quant campaign uh, mentioned um, buying their, their Quant fashions from here. And there was another one, um, but only very um, brief information I managed to find on this, um, which was called Scene One, that was opened in the Overgate, uh, Dundee Overgate in June 1967. And it was part of the, the first redevelopment um, of the shopping centre. Um, and as you can see, it also cites uh, stocking uh, Mary Quant on its advertisements. Scene one seems to have taken some of its inspiration from the bizarre boutiques as it incorporated music um, as part of its marketing. There was a disco, there was a place where you could hear records, um, and there was a space for bands to play as well. Um, it also incorporated a restaurant as well, um, like the original bazaar on the King's Road, um, which as I mentioned had a, a restaurant in the basement, um, but unfortunately it only lasted a year. Um, and this was again some really um, initial research that I've been doing. So uh, Glasgow um, also had a really interesting um, history of, of boutiques and, and boutique shopping at this time. Um, I've not been able to find out if either of those boutiques, these boutiques stopped quant. Um, one of them is called The Underground. It was in Henderson's basement on Sucky Hall Street. Um, it's where the current um, uh, Savoy Centre is. Um, and as you can see from its advertisements uh, on the left here, um, it advertised itself as just being like the King's Road, um, only nearer. Um, and then there was another one um, on Buchanan Street as well that you can see on the right hand side, um, which is called Justin uh, Latter. Um, and in terms of its imagery and its graphics, um, it definitely seems to be sort of inspired by, by Quant um, and by Bazaar, but I haven't yet been able to find out if they were stock of Quant. So uh, turning the story back to Quant, um, by spring 1965, she was generating 200 designs a year uh, for mass production that comprised of four collections of 50 garments each um, for Ginger Group. And there was also the introduction of the Buttricks pattern. So as I mentioned, this is really how she launched her career back in the 50s where she was using Buttricks patterns and adapting them and she starts producing her own. Um, and these were really, really important uh, to the story of, of her uh, democratizing fashion um, because it really expands on that idea of you could purchase and, and own a quant creation, uh, but to your own budget, depending on how much you could spend on fabric. These were launched in 1964 and were hugely successful. Uh, several patterns sold over 70,000 copies. One of the most successful um, that is featured in the exhibition is the Miss Muffet pattern. Um, and this was a simple pattern and um, that looked good with a uh, plain uh, or patterned fabric. Um, and that's it on the left here. Um, and then from the mid sixties, as we saw um, a few weeks ago with uh, Steph's wonderful talk, uh, the makeup range uh, was launched as well. So in, in terms of our boutiques in, uh, in London, um, she opened a third in 1967 uh, on 113 uh, New Bond Street, but increasingly at this point, it was the mass produced aspects of the business. Um, again, as Steph covered the, the tights, the cosmetics, etc which were gaining the most attention in uh, the fashion press um, towards the end of the 60s. And by 1970, which was sort of in, in line with the uh, financial downturn um, of the 70s, uh, Archie McNair, ever the financial mind, instigated the decision to close all three um, of the bizarre shops in London. 
the argument being that uh, financial security was easier to obtain through the licensing um, rather than the boutiques. Um, and as, as you'll know, that's how the story continues today. So to conclude the story of Quant's boutiques, um, the King's Road, as always, uh, continued to be an area for innovative designers uh, to make their mark on the fashion world. Quant closed the King's Road branch of uh, Bazaar in 1970, um, and Vivian Westwood opened her boutique uh, with Malcolm McLaren, uh, called Sex, further down and 430 King's Road in 1974, inheriting the mat mantle of fashion innovator into the new age of punk. And thank you for listening. Thank you, Kirsty. That was great. So I think now we have about eight, well, actually nine questions in the chat to try and get through. And I believe we have about 15 minutes to try and do that. So we're going to try our best. So bear with us. So let's go to the first one. So the first question actually was referring to the collections when you were setting the scene for Vini Dundee. And it's from, I'm afraid there's not a, there's not a name, but 780051 has asked, where did the other 60% exhibits come from to add to the exhibits from London? Yes, um, this, is, this was, um, so basically the, the exhibition was uh, researched over a period of two years um, uh, at V&A South Kensington before it came to London. And the reason that exhibitions take such a long time is they're basically, I guess, like writing a book. Um, so much research goes into them. And part of that research is reaching out to different collections um, across the UK um, to find out what they had, um, museum collections uh, in the UK to find out what they have in their collections. Um, so some of the big lenders to the show were uh, Bath um, Fashion Museum, um, Manchester uh, Art Gallery, Leeds, um, Brighton Museums, um, Manchester Museums, um, London College of Fashion, which was a big part of the makeup display um, at the end of the show. There was also some private lenders as well. Um, and uh, obviously the, the We Want Quant campaign uh, ended up um, supplementing uh, huge parts of the show too. So it's the same for, I mean, obviously v and uh, fashion, uh, fashion collection is incredible. It's like, I mean, when I was there, I think it was like 105,000 objects. It's probably, when I left like two years ago, it's probably a lot more than that now, um, but the collections aren't comprehensive. So obviously every time you do an exhibition, although you have like a sort of, core the core objects that you, you want to include and um, there will always be uh, loans um, that you want to include as well to supplement that story and, and tell that story a bit more. Thank you. So we've also got a question here from Tracy Smith. <laughs> are there any modern fashion brands that you feel are compar comparable, sorry, with Quant in terms of creativity and visual merchandising and window displays? That's a very good question. Yeah, um, I mean, obviously we enjoyed a pretty incredible talk from um, Faye from, from Louis Vuitton, uh, Vini Dundee back, do you when that was, was that the beginning of this year? I think, yeah, I think there's there's definitely, in terms of like high-end fashion brands, um, I think, yeah, Louis Vuitton are definitely up there in terms of, innovation and, and pushing boundaries and so on. Um, in terms of the sort of like setup of the quant shop and the idea of all these different sort of areas um, of activity going on, um, it doesn't exist anymore, but Colette in Paris, the, the, the store that, that was pretty, I would say it's definitely within the ethos um, of quant and Dover Street Market um, in, in Piccadilly in London. Um, they've got a definitely sort of yeah, a similar spirit, I would say. Yeah. Great, thank you. And then I've got another question here that we found in the chat box. So I'm just going to read this out. So I'm hoping I'm pronouncing the name right, which is Siobhan. Um, the objects had very exciting lives. Did you have any special challenges in repair and preservation? Yeah, I think this is definitely going back to, this goes back obviously to the story at v &A South Kensington. Um, but yeah, this is, I think, another part of uh, Jenny Fenwick's um, story as well. So from my memory, and Jenny, please correct me in the chat if I'm wrong, but I think your, your dress had definitely had a, a good life 
um, and I think there was a red wine stain on it, if I'm correct. Um, and that was obviously a challenge uh, for, for textile conservation colleagues at VNA South Kensington, um, because obviously you do want to preserve the fact that the object has had it's had a history, a person has owned it, a person has worn it, but you also don't want to, I guess, display things with stains on them if you can work around that. Um, so the when this object um, became part of the collection or became part of the show, um, it went to went to the textile uh, conservation team um, to a really skilled uh, colleague who's got expertise in textile cleaning, um, and she managed to clean out the the stain. Um, on the dress. Um, and for those of you who saw uh, the VNA program, um, Secrets of the Museum, um, Jenny's story is, is part of that. Yes, I think it's, I think it's, yeah, I think, I mean, this is a, I would say this is a sort of story for museum objects, uh, dress objects in general, but yeah, how do you sort of strike that balance with showing, yeah, that that object has had, yeah, has, has been worn, has been used, has had a history, but um, also making it look good for for display and luckily the team at VNA South Kensington textile conservation team are absolutely magicians um, and they can do amazing wonderful things and hide stains without cleaning them and and so on. Wonderful thanks so much and um, I think we could all do a bit with um, information about cleaning red wine yeah. stains out. <laughs> yeah. I think that would be excellent. Yeah pretty useful. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we have another question from M Gardine um, what year did Mary Quant use the flower logo on the bazaar shop front and on her merchandise? That's a good question. Um, I don't know that offhand because I'm really bad with dates. Again, I think Steph's in the chat, she could comment on that. I think it's from the late 50s. Um, but I can, I can definitely clarify that with you. I just can't remember off the top of my head right now. No worries, thanks so much. And sometimes it's always good to know that there's extra information to find out there as well. <laughs> um, so 780051, I feel like I'm reading out bingo numbers, <laughs> has asked a very good question. Hats were for Sundays, in quotation marks. How far did Quant alter this image and how widely was this taken on across the beast? The, sorry, could you repeat the question, please? Hats were for Sundays. Mm -hmm. How far did Quan alter this image and how widely was this taken on across the piece? Do you think, with regards to what Quan managed to do about hats only being for Sundays, is what I'm inferring from that question? Yeah, I think, I mean, that's part of the whole kind of, um, that's part of the whole kind of, I suppose, like change in, in fashion and fashion becoming less conservative at the time, obviously. Um, if you look at the history of fashion, like even going back to like, you know, the 16th, 17th century, there was very much like women had to to cover their heads in public. Um, and definitely going into the 19th century as well, if you were outdoors, you would have to, yeah, you'd have to wear some sort of like head covering or so on. Um, Quant's really interesting in that although she was obviously an innovator in fashion and she was constantly pushing the boundaries in terms of what you could do with skirt lengths and with them um, with textiles and so on but there's definitely aspects of her like she's constantly referencing the past um you know she uses collections where she references sailor suits um that were worn by children in the late 19th early 20th century um she references uh, william morris patterns and so on um, and knickerbockers and so on. So I think, I think the the hats sort of come back to that. Though, although she was very much in a, she was trying to sort of capture the ethos of a time that was, you know, like changing from the fifties and the forties, where women weren't expected to wear hats, but there was still that sort of nod to tradition, but subverting tradition as well. Um, is what I would say. Great, thank you. Um, so Stephanie has just put in the chat. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> that the logo was officially trademarked in 1966. Thank you, Steph. So that's Sorry, great I information. Forgotten that day. Thank you, thank you, Stephanie. It's always good to have <laughs> um, knowledgeable people taking part as well, um, as well as us. <laughs> so Claire has asked the following question: In Quant's early years, when she was developing her ideas about fashion and presentation, was there pushback or hostility from established brands and outlets? question as well um i think 
I think after quant, um, one of the things I was sort of was going to add in, um, but sort of ran out of time for, was that you know there, there's fashion brands like uh, Biba and Granny takes a trip, um, that so on that are I guess almost a kind of like successors to quant, but within her lifetime, um, that take on aspects of her. Um, her like branding and, and visual mer merchandising and so on. Um, I'd say it was maybe the other way that I don't know if there was actually pushback, but I wonder if there was more of a kind of like sort of subtle inspiration and um, yeah, and more formal, more formal shops became more innovative in, in how they were displaying things, I would say. Yeah. Okay, sure. Thank you. And we've also just had um, Fiona ask, um, are those quant clothes on the rack behind us? <laughs> and if so, please show us. Uh, Jules, that's a question <laughs> so, for you. <laughs> that might actually be a question for my group of uh, colleagues, which is actually, it's a handling collection which um, Peter, one of my colleagues, has had made by um, a lady whose second name um, escapes my mind, but I know her first name is Meredith. And oh, Meredith Town. Ber Meredith Town. And there are several objects that are used as a handling collection. Obviously, that presents... Um, other you know things to jump around with the current situation lots of hand sun and waiting for it to dry in before <laughs> you touch them with the alcohol but they definitely have been used by some schools so far and they are a fabulous collection and if you are with a community group or you would like a kind of virtual showcase of that you can get in touch with the learning team and we can arrange that for groups especially Peter, he's always keen to do that kind of thing. I'm going to quickly go back to the questions because I'm conscious that we've got about five minutes left because time is just flying away with us. So from Cheryl B, she has asked, um, hi, there's a quote on the wall of the previous photos which refers to mods. Was Quant the first person to use the word before it was used in reference to mods and rockers? That's one part of the question. And those clothes didn't look like typical mod wear from the 60s. Did it just mean the modern miss of that period? You know, the modern kind of girl yeah. of that period? Um, I think so, yeah. And I, to be honest, I'm, I'm really not sure if she was the first person to use that. I doubt that she was. I think it was, I'm, I'm pretty sure that it was in use um, before then. But yeah, it was very much the idea of, yeah, the modern. Um, and she made this this look more like widespread, widespread and more accessible. I think it was sort of like the cleanness of this look, the picture that I was referring to um, in Harper's Bazaar, I think it was of her wearing like leggings and a, a jumper. So it was, yeah, they're very much the, the clean lines, the simplicity, the, yeah, the modernness um, of this look. But I don't know if she was the first person to use that, uh, to use the word um, from, yeah, I think it might have been around for a little bit before that. Great, thank you. Um, and Tracy has also asked, where did the original props, signage, staging, etc., used in the shop go? Were they archived? Were they lost, disposed of? Like, is there any more information about um, all those amazing props that you've um, showed us? I think Steph will know a lot more about this than me, because obviously she was, she, you researched the, the original show as it was at v and South Kensington. Um, I don't know if they make up part of the archive that is the, the Mary Quant archive um, that's now owned by her son. Um, I'm, I'm not in, entirely sure. I mean, obviously from the show, the things that we have are, um, for example, we have like a, a carrier bag, but that is a loan. Um, I don't think that's from, from the archive itself. So I don't know if even if those things still exist anymore. Um, I think the, the nature of shop design at that time was just that you sort of like ripped things out and, and started again rather than preserving them. Um, yeah, so I don't think much of it survives. Okay. Well, you would infer that after your comment about do we have a stuffed partridge? Was yeah, that partridge? it's true. Yes, yeah, so kind of think. <laughs> oh, yes, yeah, right. Steph said, yeah, they don't. Yeah, I don't think they do. But yeah, so, so Stephanie said, sadly, the shop design and props do, didn't survive in the Mary Quant personal archive. Yeah. I like think they probably said. just used them for a party. <laughs> yeah. on. That, but that's just my personal. Yeah, the things that we have in, in the exhibition are um, like letterheads and yeah, the bags and so on. And I think they're really quite rare survivals. Um, as Steph said, I think, yeah, pretty, probably very ephemeral and, and not meant to be around for a long time. Indeed. So um, somebody's asked, I'm just conscious of time, we've got two very quick questions to finish with, but we've got one just before that. 
that's just a little, can you say a little bit more about the ginger group that inspired the name being taken on for the Quant Collection? And that's also by a, an anonymous attendee, but again, a number 780051, which I think may be Avon from earlier, but I, I could be wrong. So Kirsty, could you just say a little bit more about the ginger group that inspired think, the name? Yeah, I, to be honest, I don't know, um, I don't know specifically what, um, what like, uh, period um, of political history that she was referring to um, when she used the name. Um, like I said, just that it was seen as a sort of like a way to push um, push ideas through, which I think is really synonymous with her as as a designer um, and and as a brand. Um, but yeah, I can I can definitely follow up on that to find out if there was, if it was like a particular era or, or something that she was referring to. Yeah. Wonderful, thank you. And a very quick question. Is the exhibition going anywhere after Dundee? Uh, yes, I think it's pretty, I think it's open knowledge it's going to Australia um, after it after it closes um, at Dundee. So it shuts here on the 17th um, of January 2021. So you've still got a, a couple of months um, to see it and then it goes to uh, Bendigo um, in Australia. So it really will be across the world, then. Yeah, that's amazing. So, uh, it's, you know, Australia was also stopped her clothes too, so it's nice that yeah, it's, going, it's going back there. That's great. Um, and a very last one to finish on before I thank everybody um, is it was really somebody saying thank you very much. It was very interesting from Amy G. Do you have any recommended reading about um, Mary Quan in particular, Kirsty? I think definitely the first thing to start with is uh, Quant by Quant, um, her autobiography. Um, and obviously the because that sums up so much of her as a designer and, and the early days of Bazaar um, a lot of the quotes that I used in my presentation today were, were taken um, from her um, and I guess the other recommended reading if you ha haven't read it already is definitely the catalogue for the show as well um, it involved as I said the show involved a huge amount of research and you can really tell that from from the people that that wrote for the catalogue, so from so many different perspectives. So for example, um, Steph, uh, one of the curators uh, writing about the models um, who were involved uh, with Quant, um, to Beatrice Bielan from Museum of London writing about cosmetics, um, to uh, Johanna Agerman-Ross, uh, from also from v and said Kensington, writing about um, Quant's interior design and, and more about the interior um, of the shop as well. So yeah, it's, it's a good read. I think that neatly brings us to a close today. So thank you everyone for attending. Really appreciate, although we can't see you, we feel your presence <laughs> online. So thank you for coming.